Hello everyone, welcome back to the Gates of Halta. We're going to continue with our lesson on discovering the true history of the Negro. And as a reminder, August of 2019, the United States will commemorate the 400th anniversary of when our ancestors were brought to this land. So I asked you last time if you thought it was a coincidence that they're now having this discussion about reparations. I don't think that it's a coincidence. I believe that this discussion is connected to this 400th year anniversary. So we're going to continue uncovering the truth about who we are as a people. Amazingly, DNA is now uncovering some surprising, show you some maps to confirm a lot of what I've been saying. Let's take a look at this map. You can actually download this map so that you can get a better look at it. I have the information here where you can pull it up. It's a map from 1732. It's called Negro Land in Guinea with the European settlements. So take a look at this area right here. This area was called Negro Land. Here we have the area that was Timbuktu. I can remember us using that word Timbuktu when I was a child. I, we had no idea that it was actually a real place, but it was a very vibrant city. Here you have the Niger River in here. And if you drop down to this area here in Guinea, you have here the, the Grain Coast. This is where they came to get the grain here, the Gold Coast. And right in here, the Slave Coast in that Benin area right here. And then of course you have the Atlantic right here. But this map, you know, when you first, when I first saw this, just to know that there was a place called Negro Land, it really surprised me. I'm going to show you another map to bring this in even closer. Okay, so this is a close up, but here is the area, the Slave Coast area that I was talking about. And this map is from 1747. But you see this KM up here? That's Kingdom of Judah or Weda. This was Slave Coast. And in this area, they knew that there were Jews here. Now, they didn't call themselves Jews. They were called Yehuda or Yehudi, um, representing the tribe of Judah. But what I'm showing you is that when they came into this area to take these slaves, they knew who the people were. I'm actually going to show you another map where it was on the map. It was written on the map. So we know that they knew who they were looking for when they came in and snatched these slaves. Let's take a look at this next map. This is a very good close-up to show you the information that was written on this map. You, you have Timbuktu up here. You have Negrita, this says, which was Negro land, now Nigeria. But... Look down here, this area that says Lam Lem. It says, according to Edrisi, the land hereabout was peopled by Jews. Now, this was written on this map. So, they knew who they were going after. The slave traders knew that they were looking for the Negroes those who were in Negro land. If you get a chance, pull up these old maps. There's a lot of information here. 
I wanted to show you this map because it has the trafficking, the route. So between the 15 and 1600s, you see here that they were bringing them out of that same area right in here near the Niger River, West Africa, taking them into Rio de Janeiro, Salvador, here into Cuba, then after 1619, bringing them into New Orleans and Savannah, and also taking them into Europe, Lisbon, Liverpool. But can you think of another group of people where there is a record showing that they were scattered all over the world like this? This, this definitely shows us that the Bible was referring to Judah, just like it said, Judah would be scattered to the four corners of the earth. And this map, this route is showing us that that is exactly what happened. This is the scripture reference to show that Judah was going to be scattered to the four corners of the earth. Now, the other tribes... It also lists where they are as well. So it says, Isaiah 11, 11 through 12, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The map that I just showed to you confirms the scripture of how Judah was scattered around the world. This is a confirmation of that scripture. This is another good resource you may want to use. I have the information here if you want to screenshot that and pull it up yourself. This was written by Maurice Fishberg in 1911, and the title is The Jews, A Study of Race and Environment. And I'll just read some of this from page 149. It says, It is stated that the Falashas are not the only Jews of Negro race. Bastion speaks of Negroes living on the Luango coast in Western Africa. They are called there M Mavambu or Judeos. <laughs> Let's drop down here. It says, although in other places they are despised, here they take a dominating position or at least such as to be respected and partly even feared because they are rich and have most of the commerce in their hands. The same author claims that though they are of Negro race, still he detected Semitic fac facial features in their physiognomies. So another source confirming that they knew who those people were that they were enslaving. And they hid this information and they're now promoting another group of people and saying that they are the true Israelites. But the awakening, it is happening. And we're not the only ones discovering the truth. Let's take a look at this next video. Another area in Africa you have... Uh something big happening is in Nigeria you have the Igbo people or Igbo pronounced either way there's 40 million of them also Christians like I spoke about before how that could happen to the children of Israel very easily but also a lot of them are now coming out and converting back or adopting the, the rules of the Torah without all the paganism that they've been practicing for hundreds of years there's been books written about it 
from scholars in Nigeria, from scholars from the Jewish people. And where it gets interesting is, in America, there was a slave trade. And a lot of the slaves, a very high percentage of them, came from Western Nigerian ports. And in America today, you see a, a very large movement of African Americans who say that they're the real chosen people, that they're the children of Israel, they're the Judeans. You know, so what, are they just trying to create a, an identity for themselves because they were slaves, or is there really something here? And the answer is, most likely there is something there. And most likely, maybe that they were the original Israelites, and maybe that the Jewish people today who are white Caucasian people um, came in a little bit later on. We know that some of the greatest sages of the transmission of the Torah were converts from Rome. At the end of that video, it sounded like somebody just fell out of their chair when he said that. And I'm just saying that I don't know that to be true. But he said that maybe they came in later and they were converts. And that maybe uh, that the Negroes were the original. And if we're going to believe scripture, then that's what's being shown here because the Ashkenazi Jews, um, they are from Japheth. They are descendants of Japheth. They are not descendants of Shem. So the information that's being revealed now is confirming what the Bible has already said. The other uh, one that the Bible talks about that there are still folks who refuse to accept this truth is about is uh, Mizraim. Mizraim is Egypt. They keep saying that the Egyptians are Europeans. And if you look at this information here based on the scripture, clearly they were not. Now, if we even use the argument of the um, Bible commentators, they still want to pitch that lie or the cur about the curse of Ham saying all of the black race is a curse because Ham was cursed which is not true Noah never cursed Ham he cursed Canaan but even using their own reasoning if that is the case wouldn't that have included Egypt so you see all of that is just to promote that ideology of white supremacy because they refused to accept that blacks could have created anything great and there could not have been any great black civilizations which is a lie but rather than acknowledge the truth they keep promoting these lies and folks who are not reading the scriptures for themselves and just listening to them then you're going to keep believing that lie. Now, they know the truth. They know the truth. And the Bible has a name for people like that who they know the truth, but they refuse to accept it. And it's called reprobates, where they would rather exchange truth for a lie. So I choose to believe the Bible. Here's some more corroborating evidence about the Egyptians. Herodotus said the Egyptians had black skin and woolly hair, and he said the Ethiopians looked the same way. Aristotle, he said the Ethiopians and Egyptians were black. Of course, we just saw that the Bible says they're both sons of Ham. And then the Egyptians call themselves Kemet, which means black. So, in order to keep believing the lie, you just have to throw away all the truth and just refuse to accept it. So let's, so, let's show you some more. This publication right here may address some of the naysayers who refused to believe that the Egyptians were black or people of color. And some of them use the argument that, you know, they're finding statues like this one right here with European features, clear European features, and mummies that are European. So 
I want to, you know, use this publication to help folks understand why that's the case. Because when um, Alexander conquered Egypt, and after he died, it um, the Seleucid dynasty and then the Ptolemaic dynasties, they came in and they took over. They were Macedonian Greeks. And um, they saw themselves as heirs of the ancient Egyptians. So they began to dress like them. They infused a lot of the Egyptian customs and uh, they mixed it with the Greek culture. But uh, they actually came, claimed to be sons and daughters of the sun god Ra. They not only called themselves Pharaoh, but they used all of the titles of the early uh, Egyptian rulers. So they made themselves look exactly like the pharaohs, to include Cleopatra. Now, I know there are Negroes on Facebook arguing with folks about Cleopatra being black. She was not. She was a Greek. She was Greek. She was not a woman of black skin, in other words. Uh, But it was because they made themselves look like the pharaohs. And this publication will help you to understand that information. You can look this up on your own to prove this, but it's called the Ptolemies, Hellenistic Kingship in Egypt by Stefan Pfeiffer. It says, the allegedly pure Greek city of Alexandria thus in reality housed a mixture of Greek and Egyptian religions because the rulers themselves considered the Egyptian religion and representation important for their self-representation and thereby formed an invented tradition of tracing back their kingship to pharaonic times. They used the artistic and religious dictions of their pharaonic predecessors because they wanted to give their new and constantly contested kingship a traditional legitimation and sacral aura. However, there is an important fact that shows how the new Egyptian looking king was something other than his old Egyptian counterpart. Serapis, Isis, and Bubastis were Greco Egyptian gods who were something new not only in their Greek appearance but also in their religious conceptualization. Even the statues of the Ptolemies at the pharaohs were not purely Egyptian in style. The pharaoh had locks that protrude under his nemesis headscarf. So these these are the you can see um, Negroes today with the braided hairs, the locks, uh, thick braids that they wear. They're wearing the same styles today. It said the the ancient pharaohs had locks under their headgear. So this should explain why you would have mummies, you know, with European features, because of course, when they died, they would have been embalmed just like their predecessors. They would have gone through the same rituals because they were actually presenting themselves like the ancient pharaohs. So hopefully that will explain that a bit more. And I'm actually going to show you something about these locks and so that you will see that they had to have woolly hair. Let's take a look at this next one. So let's take a look at this information from Cambridge University. They hosted an exhibition devoted to Afro combs. Yes, Afro combs. So this will, you know, prove what I was just saying to you previously. It says the University of Cambridge is staging a major exhibition. 
exploring the 6,000 year history of the Afro comb and the politics of black, black hair. The fascinating display charts the inception of the comb in ancient Egypt through to its ascendancy as a political emblem post 1960s. I want to drop down here. It says items on display at Fitzwilliam include hundreds of combs from pre-dynastic Egypt to contemporary picks. Why would they need Afro combs and picks if they didn't have woolly hair like Africans? <laughs> Let's drop down to this portion. It says, the idea behind the exhibition was to take a fresh look at Egyptology within the parameters of Africa and all its diversity, rich heritage, and culture, says Ashton. Interestingly, she says the earliest combs in the collection are from Egypt. And this alongside her scholarly research has left her with no doubt that ancient Egyptians were racially and culturally black African. <laughs> Need I say more on that? I wanted to share this next article with you because it really gets to the root of why there are folks who still refuse to accept the ancient Egyptians were black because that falsehood about white supremacy is is what's driving all of this and they have to defend that at all costs so this is called were the ancient egyptians black or white scientists now know written by william perry egyptologists writers scholars and others have argued the race of the ancient egyptians since at least the 1970s some today believe they were sub-Saharan Africans. Let's drop down. Reactionaries, meanwhile, say that there's never been any significant black civilizations, an utter falsehood, of course. There were several, in fact, highly advanced African empires and kingdoms throughout history. Curiously, some extreme right groups have even used blood group data to proclaim a Nordic origin to King Tutankhamun and his brethren. That is the crux of this, you all. They are never going to admit this truth. They don't care what it costs because they have to main that ide maintain that ideology about white supremacy. After all, how do you justify slavery if, if you have to acknowledge that black people built a great civilization? Because th your whole premise was black people are animals. Because their color is dark, they are less than human. We've used that to justify our actions to enslave them, to lynch them, to maim them, to write these laws that will segregate um, are their people from ours keep them separate because they're not as clean as us. They're not as smart or intelligent. That That is what is upholding this, you all. They know the facts. They know the truth. But they are never going to accept that because then they cannot explain how then did these black people who are animals and unintelligent build this great civilization. Now this next video is interesting to say the least, but it shows you just how much this idea of uh, racial superior superiority has influenced this nation and this culture based on a skin color. Take a look at this. When I saw this headline, I kind of laughed and I said, oh, this is so ridiculous. Yet another person claiming it's racist to have a white Santa, you know? And by the way, for all you kids watching at home, Santa just is white, but this person is just arguing that, that maybe we should, we should also have a black Santa. Just because it makes you feel uncomfortable doesn't mean it has to change. You know, I mean, yeah. Jesus was a white man too, but you, you know, it's like, we have, he was a historical figure. I mean, that's a verifiable fact, as is Santa. I just want right. the kids watching to know that. You know what? I don't think there's anything anyone can say to change her mind. However, 
Take a look at this picture. This is one of the oldest known depiction of Christ in the Coptic Museum in Cairo, Egypt. Take a look at his features. Now let's read the scripture from Revelation that is describing what his skin looked like. It says, and his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. You all, if it said they, it looked like it had been burned, anything that's been burnt is dark, almost black. So how can we look at the scripture and then say, no, that's not really true? You're intentionally ignoring what's being said here. So this next video is a guy actually burning brass to show us what it looks like after it has been burnt. That last video really confirms, you know, the scripture that we saw in Revelation about what the color of the Messiah had to be. And, and I hate that we even have to have this discussion to have to bring that out. But it's time now. It's time to address these lies. We can't come together as one under the banner of love with lies. It has to be based on truth. We have to accept truth, even if it's uncomfortable. Because for a lot of us, we've had, we have images <laughs> of the Messiah with blonde hair and blue eyes. But if you think about it, he couldn't have li looked that way and lived in that area in Arabia. It's, it's just not possible. But we, we didn't know anything different. We didn't know that there were people twisting scripture and trying to rewrite history because they were trying to uphold white supremacy. And you tell one lie, now you have to tell another to prove that lie. And the house of cards is it's falling now. It really is. Um, the evidence is, is there for anyone who will seek it out. Really, it is there. But we have to come together based on truth. What is the Bible saying? The scripture is telling us what he looked like. And just think about it, you all. How would Mary and Joseph 
have blended in in Egypt? How did Moses blend in and live in the house of Pharaoh? Pharaoh was trying to kill the Hebrew babies. He would have recognized that there's a child in my house with white skin. You know, and again, the Egyptians <laughs> had to be black. We have to agree with scripture. It tells us they were they are descendants of Ham. And the evidence is also proving who we are as a people. But that's for identity only. It's for us to know who we are, our history, our heritage. We still have to receive salvation. And it comes through no other, other than the Messiah. It comes through him. The identity can't save us. So I, I wonder about folks you know, who have this complex about the skin color, when he comes back with dark brown skin and an afro, is it going to cause people to lose their faith? That would be truly sad. It would be truly sad. But we have to bring out these truths. We have to address them. It's time out for the lies. No more, no more. We have to speak out and speak truth. Let's agree with the scripture. So the next time I will be talking about the curses because we have been made to believe that we were a curse because of our skin. It's not the skin. It was the sin that caused us to be in this condition. And we're going to bring that out in this next discussion. So join me next time at the Gates of Halta, where we take a deeper look at history and the Bible to uncover some of the half-truths that has opened the door to deception. Join me next time, everyone. Shalom.